I like watching. I like watching the numbers. It's like they're walking in the door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and well, you hear the doorbell ring as well. Um, for those of you folks who are joining us and who are waiting patiently in the uh, waiting room, thank you so much. Um, we were having some technical difficulties this day and age. I guess we're all starting to get used to that. And um, so we appreciate your patience and flexibility while we were navigating through some of those challenges. Um, I just want to give a minute or two for everyone to, to hop on here. We had a ton of interest in um, this webinar today. And so everyone, happy Saturday. Take a deep breath. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, and again, thanks for your patience. While you guys are waiting, if you want to write in the comments section the uh, your name or the name of your child and how old they are and where you're from so we can kind of gear our presentation to the ages of the children you're working with, that'd be great. Thank you for that, Teresa. Yeah, that's a good way to uh, spend the next minute or two. And when we see, well, we don't have more folks joining us, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay, <clears throat> I think we're in a good spot here. Um, I don't want to keep you folks waiting any longer than you already have. So um, again, we appreciate it. Good morning. Um, for some of you, good afternoon. Um, it's it's a little after 10 here on the West Coast, but we know we have um, folks joining us from all over the country, which is really exciting. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is Elizabeth Lewis, and um, um, I am the Director of Education at the Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area. And we wanna welcome you today um, to our second installment. Is that right, Teresa? This is our second mm -hmm. one. Um, <clears throat> we are focusing on a series that um, it will focus on the needs of individuals with uh, co-occurring um, diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorder. Um, we are going to address the needs of those individuals um, as well as their families caregivers, educators, medical professionals interested in learning more about that dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. Um, like I said, my name's Elizabeth. On behalf of Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area, we'd love to say welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, this webinar, today's webinar, is Structured Home Teaching Activities for Down Syndrome um, Autism Spectrum Disorder, or DSASD. You're going to hear us say that a lot. Um, family. So joining me today is Miss Teresa Understall. Hi, Hello. Teresa. Hello. Um, she is on the Down Syndrome uh, Connection of the Bay Area's staff. She's serving as the DS. ASD consultant. Uh, Teresa is also the author of a wonderful book, if you haven't heard of it. It's called A New Course, A Mother's Journey, Navigating Down Syndrome and Autism. Um, we're going to be monitoring questions today. So I'm going to take you for through the first several slides, we're gonna learn a little bit about the approach that um, Teresa is going to be going into lots of details and giving you wonderful examples. So I'm gonna kind of set it up um, to talk about this approach and then she's gonna uh, take it from there. Now, we're gonna be monitoring questions in that Q&A um, chat box that you see on your screen. Now, unless there's something that's super, super important to interject um, during the presentation, um, which we will, if, if there is something that comes up that we think is preventing us from moving forward to the next slide, um, then we'll, we will address it at that time. Otherwise, we're gonna save those questions and answers for the end. We have a two hour block scheduled for this presentation. We don't know or anticipate that it's gonna go that long. And so that should give us plenty of time to address questions at the end. And a lot of times, once we get through it, we might have already answered some of your questions, right? And so we wanna give ourselves an opportunity to get through that content, and then we can address any straggler questions that we have after you've digested um, all of the content, if that makes sense. So I think we should go ahead and get started. 
Um, yeah, Teresa, but before we do that, if you um, just got on with us, if you would be oh. so kind to write your um, the age of your child and where you're from, so we can kind of gear our material accordingly and kind of get a sense of what you what you guys need there. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah. For those of you who just joined us, that would be wonderful. And I see that we do have some folks who are um, already giving us that information. So we really appreciate it. It helps us to know those ages and, and you know, um, the kiddos or the adults uh, that you're working with. Um, and then Teresa, whenever you're yeah. ready to share your slides. Right. Um, and I'm, hmm, <laughs> I thought I had it here. <laughs> you know any good jokes? <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Oh, give me a sec here. Um, I've had it. I thought I minimized it, but it's these things happen. I know. It's on my I desktop. Believe... I got to figure out where I can get it from my desktop. My files. I really do believe, though, that Zoom is making us all more flexible human beings, right? More patient. It's we've got to take all of the positives that are coming from. The, these virtual webinar conference worlds. And um, not only are we all becoming a bit more technically savvy, um, we are learning that that uh, immediate gratification <laughs> that we're all so used to. We're having to learn to just go with the flow, be patient and- um, Wait for it. <laughs> wait for it. We do have slides. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay. Now you're small. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. I think it'll be so good when I get it here, gang. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. And oh, slideshow maybe? Over. Yeah. I'm trying to see. I've got. Got this bar on the top here that I can't see. <laughs> oh, if you move one, two, three, four, five over, there's a slideshow next to animation. So there, tab, yeah, two more over. Transitions, animations, and slideshow. How do I move this uh, chat thing at the top here? Oh, uh, there, you should there I got it. <laughs> I got okay. it. There, you can see. So now you guys know that I'm not very tech savvy, clearly. <laughs> All right, ready? But, but you're savvy when it comes to what we are discussing today and presenting yeah. on today. You're I had that going for me, which is nice. You're very savvy with that. And that's uh, the important part, right? She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> when it comes to this presentation. Um, so, all right, folks, thank you so much for your patience. Um, Teresa, thank you so much. I'll um, start it from here and then I'll hand over uh, to Teresa so that she can really give you all of the great content that I know you're looking for. So today we're talking about structured teaching activities for DSASD families. Presented to you by Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area and uh, me, Elizabeth Lewis. Again, I'm the Director of Education here with Down Syndrome Connection and Ms. Teresa Unterstahl, our ASDDS consultant and author and mother. <laughs> so what is structured teaching? Well, structured teaching is a visually based approach to creating, a, to creating structured environments that support individuals with autism. Now, for those of you who know and work with an individual with autism and uh, an individual with Down syndrome, autism dual diagnosis, we know that um, they are strong visual learners. So this is a visually based approach. Um, structured teaching is an intervention philosophy. It was developed by the University of North Carolina Division of Teach. Now, some of you may have joined us for our Teach series that we have um, through our DSEA here at Down Syndrome Connection. Completely different thing. This has two C's in it. Um, and Teach is acronym for uh, Treatment and Education of Autistic and Related Communication handicapped children. 
Um, it allows for implementation of a variety of instructional methods. So for our learners with autism and Down syndrome, who are very strong visual learners and need that visual support and who may have significant communication challenges, expressive and receptive, um, then being able to utilize a variety of instructional uh, methods such as visual support strategies, PECs or picture exchange communication system, different sensory integration, um, uh, disc discrete trial, et cetera. This gives a kind of holistic approach to the learning strengths of um, an individual with autism and Down syndrome. Uh, oh, can you go, Teresa? Thank you. Um, so why does it work? Uh, well, you know, we found that most things work when you utilize a strengths-based approach, when we're looking on the can-dos and not the can't Dues. So this capitalizes on the strengths of students with autism. Um, it uses predictable and meaningful routines, which is huge. Um, it helps individuals with autism understand expectations. That's another biggie. Um, it promotes a sense of calm. Uh, it's tailored to individual learning styles. So it's looking at those individualized strengths and individualized challenges so that you can customize and cater it to that specific learning profile. It promotes independence, um, which is something we're always trying to do. Um, and the structures are a form of behavior management. So we're teaching your child appropriate behaviors. Then we can generalize that behavior through the visual systems that we're using as we're working with those strengths. And thank you. And yeah, most children do benefit from structure in their environment. I'm uh, this grown up uh, who does not have autism or Down syndrome benefits from some structure in my environment. Um, and of course, that's the same for our learners um, who are facing that dual diagnosis and, and different hurdles. This is my friend, Sam, the man, working with his dad. And, um, and I can tell you by working with Sam, he loves structure and that predictability. So we'll have to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So <clears throat> this is what structured teaching aims to do. Um, we're wanting to remove or reduce the need for verbal instruction. So our learners with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism, you know, we know that the communication challenges can be quite significant. There's the um, cognitive processing piece. There's the aud <clears throat> auditory piece, right? There may be some um, some auditory challenges and processing information, being able to break that down, decode it, and then, you know, the expressive communication challenge as well. So giving verbal instructions, um, especially like kind of general instructions or directives, if we're not breaking them down into very explicit steps, this can be quite confusing. And if there are any auditory processing challenges, then we're going to start getting some frustrations and confusion confusion um, because it's just not as easy to hear a directive, a verbal directive, be able to break all of it, that down, decode it, and then know exactly what to do, plan your next steps and complete them. So we're trying to remove and reduce the need for verbal instruction, which can cause further confusion and frustration by utilizing these visual aids. So we're providing visual clarification of what is to be done. Well, we've already said, children with Down syndrome and children with autism. So that dual diagnosis, especially, they're strong visual learners. We want to capitalize on those strengths. Um, providing visual aids to our kiddos is a really great way to help them understand expectations, understand next steps, be able to take control over the plan, right? Um, it shows when a task is complete, especially if we're working with something non-preferred, we need to help our kiddos understand, hey, this is the expectation. And then look, you finished it. We finished it, you're all done with it. Um, by understanding that and by being able to work through that task, we are helping to promote self-confidence. We're fostering that self-efficacy um, by completing those tasks and knowing what comes after that task, right? I complete it and woohoo, you know, we get to take a break or we get this particular preferred activity, et cetera. So uh, gaining that understanding is really important. Um, it's going to increase independence 
attendance, right? So when um, a, a student can see what's expected, they can work through the task, they can see that they've completed it. Um, the, these are, this is going to help them be able to navigate these things more independently the more and more you practice, practice these structured visual routines. Um, they'll understand the steps, what's expected. And so we're always wanting to foster independence. We want our kiddos to be able to navigate things as independently as possible. Increased participation. Well, if you, um, and, and I'm gonna say increased participation and uh, to reduce anxiety as well. So if you understand what's expected of you, you have a nice visual aid that's helping walk you through those steps and those tasks, and you complete that task, you're building your confidence, you've taken control over your own routine, you're making your choices based on what you know, what's expected of you, and what comes after the completion. And all of those things, the being able to understand next steps, being able to plan and visualize it, um, understand what's expected of you, that's going to increase participation because there aren't so many question marks hanging out. That fear of failure, that anxiety is going to be reduced because we have a clear understanding. And so um, we, you are going to get more participation without, you know, as much non-compliance. Um, and it is going to reduce that anxiety. The more we see what we can do, we're moving through it and we see that we've completed that task, we're building that confidence, building that efficacy to keep going and to work through it. And then, of course, we're focusing on target skills, critical skills. And um, through this structure, through this particular format and this way of teaching, this strategy, this is going to help our kiddos generalize these skills across environments. So there are lots of really wonderful benefits to working with this structured teaching system. And now I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, who's going to give you lots of really lovely examples and content um, to help you understand how this works and kind of put put all this into uh, into action so miss teresa awesome thank you elizabeth for teeing that up for me so perfectly all right let's go so first thing i want to talk about are just the keys to setting up a good workstation um, you want to include structure routine and visual cues and and I'm gonna ask you to put yourself in the chair. Let's say you have a new job that you're starting, something that you have never done before. And these might be some of the questions you would wanna ask your supervisor. Okay, what do I do? I'm sitting here at my desk. How much am I gonna do? What do I do next? And how am I gonna know when I'm finished? Once I'm finished, what do I do? So that's just some, some, some questions to ask yourself when you're setting up this this type of a structured teaching work system. So I'm going to talk a lot about workstations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, this is one that we do at home with my son, Nick. My son, Nick, is um, 27 years old. And I'll talk about him a little more in a bit. So how do we set this up for success? Um, first of all and foremost, be at your child's developmental level. How do we know what that is? You can look at the IEP. You can chat with the um, your child's teachers, their therapists, ABA therapists, and get get a sense of what they're doing in those environments, and and literally adapt those to what you're doing at home um, in many ways with what you have at home. Center it around your child's interests and strengths. My son Nick is and has always been really good at matching. So a lot of the, the, the examples I'm gonna show you will, will be to that because that has been uh, something that he not only is good at, but he's interested in. Before you uh, set your child down to work on a structured teaching activity, have those materials ready and available and lined up to use. If possible, and now this is not easy because we are all kind of in in the house together, but as best you can, try to limit those distractions. Figure out um, next uh, what way you want to teach. And again, I would, I would refer back to uh, your child's teacher to see if they are working from um, a left to right or a top to bottom. I'll, I'll give you two examples here in a bit. 
Next, um, make sure you pick close-ended activities. For instance, um, an open-ended activity would be putting um, uh, some Play-Doh in one of the bins to work on. Play-Doh, you could go on for hours. So that's, not, that's more of an open-ended activity. Try to pick activities that have a start and a begin, start or a beginning and an end. <laughs> so, and as much as you can, try to label everything. Again, those visuals are so important for our kids. If they can see it, they can understand it. And that's been a quote of mine, not only in my book, in my blog writing, in my consulting, but that visual form is really truly beneficial to our kids that have uh, a dual diagnosis. You can use boxes, um, file, fo file folders for activities. I mean, these can be, we're all ordering from Amazon. You can, you're gonna see some boxes that look like they were, you know, shoe boxes or Amazon boxes or plastic bins, just whatever you have to, um, that makes sense for you and your budget. And just the last two things here, break down your task if it's um, one that has several steps and use templates with step-by-step -step instructions. And again, this will be in a visual form and you'll see these as, as we move along. And the last tip I have for setting up for success is have a clearly defined place that is all done. So I've completed my activity and as much as you can have your child be the one who actually manipulates and puts those um, activities done all done as Nick does. <laughs> that gives them a sense of control and empowerment and, a, and more importantly, a feeling of accomplishment. So this is Nick. He is 27 years old. He just turned 27. He has co-occurring Down syndrome and autism. He also has verbal apraxia. Uh, I, in my uh, social media on Facebook, and Instagram, it's um, Down Syndrome with a Slice of Autism. You will see a lot of videos and pictures of Nick doing not only these structured teach activities, but, but other activities at home, some of the jobs that he does that he's good at that um, also help him to feel like he's contributing around the house and a part of our family and uh, serves as twofold a lot of the, the other activities that I show videos of give him a sense of calm because they're heavy work activities, which we'll be talking about in an in a, in a upcoming webinar. A little spoiler alert. Now, my blog also um, is nickspecialneeds.com. That is something I've been writing since uh, 2012. There are a ton of subject areas that I cover specifically for dual diagnosis. If you go to blog number, I believe it's 215, that one is about structured teaching as well. Here you can see Nick, I'm gonna go ahead and point this out. You'll see it a little bit later, but this is uh, a school supply order. And what he will do is put these items on this template and then he'll drop it in the, the zipper bag. You could use a Ziploc bag. I just you know, I'm, I'm all about a good dollar store, dollar spot, <laughs> and um, complete that order. On the right side, we have bin number three, where he is doing some assembly with nuts and bolts. So th this is just a real basic um, look at what you'll need to set up your structured teaching area. Uh, what physical structure you want to use. Do you want to use a desk? I tend to use the kitchen island. That's just um, the easiest place for us. Um, secondly, uh, what kind of schedule do you want to use um, so that they know how much work they're going to be doing? Your actual work systems will be the third element. And then what supporting visual structures you're going to need? Like I pointed out, just pointed out those templates where you could see, okay, I'm gonna put this in, this in, this in, and then zip it up and put it away. You'll be seeing a lot of these coming up. So start small. If you've never done this before, and most of you probably, or your kids are probably doing this at school, if not more, but start small first, then I, I do the work, and then I get a highly preferred, coveted, wonderful reward that they get to pick. 
Um, I try to, or I, I suggest that you pick something that they don't get a lot often, something that's like, ooh, this is a big deal. And the, the reward could change. It, you know, one day they may be in the mood for, you know, like right now my son, for a while he wanted to work for Sprite. He likes Sprite. But lately he's been wanting his, his um, hostess ho-hos. <laughs> so um, I'm not big on using food for reward, but at this point I'm like, hey, whatever gets, gets you motivated, do it. I mean, I, it could be a musical toy. It could be something like this. How about this? How about a twerking, dancing dog? All right, just for fun, <laughs> this does play a song. He is, it does, the dog does twerk. In the comments, um, see if you can guess what song this, this dog plays. If you write it in the comments and if somebody gets it right, you're gonna get, possibly get a free copy of my book, The New Course. So drop those in the comments. I'll look forward to seeing those. And we'll, we'll revisit that at the end. So again, find that currency, whatever motivates your child and go from there. <clears throat> and then gradually you can build up the task to, I would say go maybe one to two. And then from there, add another one and another one. Um, it's really up to you. And again, take some guidance from your, your, um, your child or your student's um, teacher their aid, the ABA therapist, um, or, you know, even the speech and speech therapist may have some ideas as well on, on, you know, giving you a directive on that. So here, here's another workstation. I actually kind of envy in this one now <laughs> on the left. I like the idea of just having those bins um, in a, in a, uh, in a drawer fashion there. Some children are more understanding and and colors and symbols. So I like the way these, they can match these up and you'll see the work inside there. I just have always with Nick used the one, two, three, four, and he will actually take this one and work on that first. And then I'll have him manipulate this there for each one, two, three, four, okay. All right, so I'm just gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive in. This is the fun part. We're gonna start the party here. So we um, we're gonna say these are just some ideas that I came. I'm, I tried to come up with. You can get a lot of a ton of ideas on Pinterest, by the way. So just we're gonna start with just some just some basic concepts, big and small. Now I like this. I think I would actually make this even bigger. A little more exaggerated, but I like the idea of of sorting the concepts of big and small, um, soft and hard items. When Nick was in first grade, he was in inclusion. He and I remember them doing a science unit. It was about geology, so they were studying rocks. And while um, the other students in his class, his neurotypical peers, were were doing um, studying more about actual rocks. Um, the uh, support teacher modified his program. So he was learning the concepts of things that are hard and things that are soft. So she would have a bin with obviously rocks like the other kids in his class, but then, then softer things like cotton balls and feathers, you know, shells, and he would divide those out and get the idea. And then you could also may maybe pair this with the idea of soft hands, you know, soft hands. Um, I think that's an important concept to to teach as well, to kind of tie in. All right, let's see what else we got here. Now here's the shoe box one, you know, <laughs> just go, go out and go and get your poker chips out and you can divide, you can sort by color here. Just have a whole bin of, of poker chips. Now again, that's just very basic. So all you need is a box and some tape and some poker chips. I love myself a good Dollar Tree, a good Target dollar spot, five below, and you can find so many things there like this. But also you can go to garage sales. They'll, they'll be starting here, up here again, I hope. And um, Goodwill stores, that type of thing to find, find learning materials as well. 
and this is just pom-poms that we're sorting here and then just oops, sorry <laughs> oopsie as nick would say <laughs> and then sorting these colors teaching that concept this one's a little more fancy but i and again a lot of these you can i i can't tell you how many times over the years that i've asked teachers for these visuals your slp your um your support teacher, your um, speech therapist, they can all give you some of these materials. Now, so this can transfer to an actual functional, functional living skill. And basically, hey, let's get those kids sorting that laundry, right? It's never too early to start. So basically um, separating lights and darks here. You could also make this an, a whole nother bin with just folding. And uh, I would say, I'll, I'll talk more about folding later, but just a, start with just a one fold over is the easiest to do with, um, these are actually Nick's underwear <laughs> and, and some washcloths, I believe. So next I'm gonna talk about counting activities, depending on your child's level. Um, again, I would refer to uh, their teacher to find out what they're doing and look look at the IEP and you can sort of gear some counting towards their developmental level. Uh, this one, again, we're using those same little blocks that you saw earlier. We could just, or little pegs and just putting those here. Uh, Closed pens, another way to do that. That also works on your fine motor. Oops, I keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Told you guys I wasn't that tech savvy. <laughs> oh. This is just some bottle caps. Just uh, that all you need there is uh, a good Sharpie and you're on your way here. On the right, you'll see something with that um, counting with that looks like fries, but they're actually, um, bleh, what do you call those things? <laughs> Blank now. What are those things? <laughs> pipe cleaner. <laughs> oh. So um, your child totally into McDonald's, you can customize something like that for them. Um, I know my son's um, speech is, is very limited, but he can say Dadools, McDonald's. <laughs> I remember one time we were driving to the airport and there was a McDonald's. All of a sudden he goes, he's probably like six. He's like, Dadools. I'm like, oh, he knows that word. <laughs> so he recognizes a good logo. That's for sure. That and then Taco Bell. Here's another one, spelling uh, spelling names. And this is just ping pong balls and just matching. And then you can also add that, that extra factor of pushing in just to give a little, you know, make it a little more fun as, there as well. So uh, magnetic letters, I'm pretty sure most of us have these around the house and all they've done here is taken um, a pie pan and, and again, use either a dry eraser or a Sharpie to work on letters and again you want to think about what their level is here uh, sight words would be another one as well as you see on the right there this i found on amazon these are just uh, uh dry erase flashcards that so you can reuse those to work on numbers and uh, alphabet this is our buddy sam the man <laughs> He is um, doing some tracing here and uh, you can find these um, again on Amazon or, or just uh, go to Lakeshore and this is a magnetic, magnetic board. And then he's got these cards that he overlays to work on tracing uh, letters and words. Sam also has a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism out there in California. All right, so let's move into some other activities. This is um, just cutting. This, this is very something you could make at home on the left side. The right one, print, there are so many printables online if you just type in Google cutting practice. Your teacher, again, your child's teacher will probably have some of these that they could share with you as well. Puzzles, don't we love a puzzle? So the one on the left is actually a homemade puzzle someone made out of, um, a cereal box, you could, again, when we talk about interest of your child, um, you could make a puzzle of something that is very interesting to them, whether it's food, whether it's a, a movie character or a cartoon character, uh, angry birds. I'm not sure what all the kids are 
into right now, but uh, you know, certainly an easy way to um, do something that's you know doesn't cost money at all. So on the right there, I like these puzzles because they do have the little pegs. It's a little easier to to manipulate, and um, I still we still do these puzzles with Nick because I mean it's sort of a for me, I feel like it's um, a comfort item and he still likes Thomas, so why not? <laughs> he likes Harold the best, I should say, <laughs> but he does like Thomas. There's a couple other puzzles. You can um, teach transportation, body parts. I think that's an important one, uh, body parts, um, especially if you look at if your child is nonverbal or very limited language and they're not feeling well, you can be able to, to you know, foster, you know, if that were to happen, where, you know, is this owie here or is this here, you know, and give them a little bit of sense of their body as well. Matching, I mentioned that Nick is the king, the master of matching, so we do a lot of these. I think it's kind of fun to to do some seasonal things, so the the one on the right there obviously is coming up, Yay, it's almost March, guys. <laughs> the, the, we have a fall one. We, we have a lot of these folder activities. And I mentioned you can you can gear bin activities, but you can also do these as just all folder activities if you, you know, depending again on the level of your child. Here's some more. Uh, weather, I think, is another very important um, skill to, to learn. You um, can also pair the weather, um, the, the weather activities with clothing. So, okay, on um, sunny, warm days and have different types of clothing, you know, you can just cut those out of magazines and, you know, the coat goes with the winter or the rain. You guys are in Cal, you guys that are in California, you're probably getting the rain right now. You can have all, you know, those type of, of clothing to kind of, so they give them, give them a sense of, of um, understanding that. The one on the right here, these are just, uh, our speech therapist made these. And um, again, you can pair this with an actual, you know, you know, having them work on their articulation as well. Yeah, I, I'm all about asking the therapists and the teachers to, <laughs> for materials. <laughs> Emotions, totally big one. I can't say enough about this. You, when you make these, some, some of our kids um, respond better to actual faces. And that, that's typical. With, with Nick, he, when he was younger, I did not use many icons at first. And so you could match the same, you know, real faces if you did not want to use the, um, these, these um, icon faces here. But I think that's an important skill to teach and it will help them kind of move into regulation. You can start here, but then I would say, let me think, when Nick was in middle school, he was able to um, explain how he felt um, using, I think he, they, they were using the PEX pictures by then. He was responding to those. And are you happy? And then why are you happy? You know, I'm at school. Uh, are you sad? Oh, why are you sad here? Oh, I miss my mom or something. Though he probably wouldn't say that right now. <laughs> so just uh, that's such an important skill. I would I would run and put this one on my first structured teaching as soon as you can. A little bit of fine motor here. And um, a lot of a lot of individuals on the autism spectrum are really good at lining up at lining up and getting everything just right. So I that's a strength. I feel like um, why not play upon that strength? So you could um, have a template. Oh, sorry, I did it again. <laughs> there we go. You you could make it. This one should probably have a template under here, Nick. Um, and and spell that out. Um, but you could take these beads. And, and also have an order, a specific order to them. So let's say pink, yellow, blue, pink, yellow, blue. And so they're lining up that sequence and working on fine motor. And then I, one of Nick's friends 
from high school has her own jewelry business called Special Sparkle, by the way. And I mean, that's, that's a skill that could turn into a business, a little micro enterprise. And then on the right, this is just, I think probably got these at a, a dollar, you know, dollar spot um, working on uh, fine motor. You could take this to another level and even get some tweezers to, to, to add another dimension to it. But I would just start with, again, you know, just working on uh, fine motor and, and uh, matching those out. This again, you, I think that's just, I don't even know, that's probably like a tray from, from uh, that you would use in your desk drawer that I just put there. But there's so many takeout ones that have like threes in it that you could reduce that down and start more simply or three or two. So that is, let's move on here. So again, talking about sequencing. Here we've got, um, you know, building a sandwich. You've got your bread, your salami, cheese, tomato, lettuce. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. No, <laughs> so, but I mean, this this could build into something in the future where you know they could be a sandwich artist at Subway. So, next one, I kind of move into more vocational, practical living skills. Nick, when he was in middle school and high school. Um, these were some of the activities that he did. The, the, um, the first one is just the sorting silverware, and that's just plastic silverware there. And then rolling uh, rolling it and putting a, um, you know, a little fancy thing on here if you wanted to. But um, either way, I mean, these are vocational jobs that could eventually um, parlay into a restaurant type of uh, position. So here are some of the templates that I had uh, showed you earlier, but um, this is, uh, Nick would take this and just set these here and then put them inside and zip that up and then put it in the finished. Okay, this is one that's not so fancy. It's just some, you can tell <laughs> that we've had those for a while. They're looking, I should probably get some new bags, but uh, again, same idea. So we started this years ago with Nick because in middle school, one of the jobs that they had um, were to fill school supply orders that people, um, you know, parents could order their school supplies. So this was sort of a smaller version of that. And, um, but that you can see where that could take you to the next level as far as a, an actual job. Okay, so these are a little more bougie. <laughs> Get a little bougie here on these. So the, this, uh, the only reason I have these is because we had a wonderful ABA therapist who came to, an in-home therapist who came to our home. He happened to be a really good at woodworking, so he made these for us. But by any means, you don't need to go this fancy, but you can, just to give you some ideas, I want to show you my bougie ones here. <laughs> so um, then we're working again on fine motor here and uh, matching and again, this could, these are all good skills to learn to, you know, for a possible uh, jobs for the future. So I kind of just put these two together because A, I wanted to show you um, when you're teaching folding, you can, you know, add either stickers or dots here and you can even color code these if you want so that they could fold those over. Um, and then this would be a, a two fold. So that's a little more, a little more advanced. The other thing I wanted to point out here is when you are doing these, these tasks, well, the first thing I said was to what, start small. So start small, don't, you're not gonna do all four here, but if you sense that your child needs a break, they either, um, you can have this break icon available or like you may be able to tell your child is getting stressed out and then you could just say, oh, Nick, or, you know, do you need a break? And then um, this is an old time timer that I had since, <laughs> I don't even know if they make them anymore. I could probably sell it on eBay maybe, but it's um, basically when the red goes, your time's up and it's time to get back to work. You can get the same time timer on an app, which is fantastic. It works not only good for when you're doing structured teaching, but also if you're doing, um, you have an activity, let's say you're getting ready to go somewhere and you wanna give them that countdown before the net transitioning, which is so important for our kids to, 
to have that that those prompts for transitioning and, and anticipating that transition. You can also use a time timer, like I said, on that app or, or something like this for brushing teeth. That's that's huge. So that's a that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> So here's Nick. He has, and this was just yesterday while I was, he was working with his personal support worker on his bins. And again, he has manipulated these on his own. And this was the last one, number four. And he put that on and pointing to his reward. Okay, so I am going to try to go to this other one to show you. Kind of, I'm gonna put it together. So give me a, give me a moment, you guys talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Feel free to ask some questions here. Oops. <clears throat> Thanks, Teresa. While you're doing that, I'm just gonna run through some of this q and I do have okay. some, I do have some guesses for the twerking oh. dog song. Okay. We can uh, do that at the end if you want, but um, I'm happy to see people are participating and throwing <laughs> out some some good ideas here. Um, I don't see, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that, um, um, let's see, you know, I don't see any questions at this time. Okay. I know that we did tell you guys, you know, hope, you know, that we would address questions at the end. Um, as they're coming to you though, if you want to, to throw some questions out there, feel free. Um, just saying we'll, we'll, we will address them all at the end. But right now I think uh, we're good to go. Oh. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna try to see if this movie will pop up here. There we go. Um, Teresa, would you like for me to, we did have a couple of questions come up. Would you like for me to ask now or are you almost to? Oh, uh, oh sorry. I'm, I'm sitting here watching and I didn't, did I not share the screen? Um, let me take a look here. I guess I didn't. <laughs> Don't see it. <laughs> okay. I'm just watching it. Party of one here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Okay. Can you guys see that? Hold on. Yes. Wait for well, it. <laughs> I don't see the movie yet, but I see yeah. that you're going there, getting there. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Can you guys hear that? No. Okay, so it's, this is one, two, three, four. So I've got them all. He's gonna match that and he just. I don't see or hear any. The only thing I see, Teresa, is um, basically a blank PowerPoint slide that has video, uh, an icon for, okay. uh, hmm for a video, but you can't see any piece of the video. Okay. Um, All right, so let's just, um, I'll just stop that. That's, you know what I will do guys, I'll put, the, I'll re-put that back on my social media. So you can, if you, if you go to Instagram, you can see that because I thought we, <laughs> that was gonna work, <laughs> wah, wah. And then I can pop, yeah, I'll just do that. It'll be on my, I'll put it, I'll put it on uh, the Facebook and also our um, uh, Instagram and the Down Syndrome Connection private group. So I'll make sure you guys get that. Well, basically it sort of went through the whole thing. And um, the, so, so we did the one, two, three, four. Actually, let me just 
back this up here. Get a little recap, so. So what the video showed was um, Nick grabbing the one. I think he had already done a couple, but anyway, he puts, again, puts those there. He um, completes the task and then puts it in an all done uh, box here that you can't see. Same thing with two, you saw that when that was the fine motor. And then we did some matching and folding on this particular one. Okay, I'm gonna skip back over. So all the ones we talked about. So um, just, just, just a quick recap and just some of my final, what I'm gonna call pro tips. Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you, Teresa. Do you have anything to share visually? Because if so, I don't see a screen share right okay. now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I... No problem. You know, while you're doing that, um, I'd love to, let's see, I'm just gonna get myself here. Here I am. Oh, oh. too close. Oh, there we go. And then we'll we'll focus on the other side. Okay. So sorry about the video, guys. But again, I'll put that on social media and you guys can see it. So uh, final recap, little what, what I'm going to call the pro tips here. Task amount, task analysis method. Use those templates. All I did was take pictures of uh, the sequencing. You can also in you know, look into your in, uh, your teachers will also have some ideas for you and I'm sure they have some that they're doing at school as well. There's so many on Pinterest. Um, you can get, you know, you can lose yourself in Pinterest, right? <laughs> so, um, focus on those independent, on independence on those tasks. Um, having them, once they've completed it, putting the one on the one so that they see I'm getting this much closer to that reward. And that again gives them a sense of control. Um, and uh, um, accomplishment, right? That's a wonderful thing. This one's a big one for, especially for my son, because in his behavior plan, he does not like to be A, corrected, or B, um, told he did something, you know, something's not right, or it should have been this way. So um, part of that is um, avoid undoing the work. So after you had that, they folded everything and put it away, um, I, I would take all those bins to another room and, and disassemble them for the next time. Um, there's one where he does, um, um, what do you call it? I'm trying to think of one to give you an example. He, he's got uh, different colors and, and um, clothes pins that he matches up. That would be one where you would um, not want to undo it afterwards. So just wait and kind of do that afterwards because you're kind of in a sense saying, oh, well, you did the work, but you know, it doesn't matter. So it does matter. Um, go at their own pace. And again, you already showed you the break icon and use that uh, and time timer as needed. And then some days like Nick will whip through these bends. Other days he's just like, you know, watching grass <laughs> grow. So, you know, just allow for that space and time for them to, to get it done in their own time. And as I mentioned before, utilize that IEP team and the ABA therapist to help you get these visuals and um, get ideas. They're, they're going to have the great ideas. So going back to behavior, um, one of the triggers in, in mixed behavior plan is, as I mentioned, being corrected. Um, and this, this isn't only for these bins. It's also for if he puts, let's say, um, he takes his plate and puts it in the dishwasher not how I would put it in. If I open it and fix it, he gets mad. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I wait till after he's gone and kind of fix it. <laughs> if he, well, I'm gonna give you another example. This morning he put his shirt and his pants on backwards. And instead of going, oh, Nick, you need to fix it. I'm like, oopsie. So I use a lot of things like that. I'm like, oh no, oops, try again. Just some of those things that, um, keep him from feeling like, well, I messed up. And, you know, he gets very defensive about that. So this is Nick in high school. And he is working at the ReStore 
uh, habitat, habitat for Humanity. They have um, people donate goods and they'll refurbish them to sell. And so here's that template. How about that? And you see um, his aide, his one-on-one -on -one para is um, doing some uh, point prompts to remind him <laughs> because Nick seems to be more fascinated with his reflection <laughs> than the work. So she's um, reminding him with that. But you can see how they use this template. They put it in these baggies and then drop it in here. So that was one of his jobs. The um, I'll give you a couple other examples of some uh, of the jobs that he had. He also um, worked at, in high school, he worked at um, a pet shelter. And so one of the, his jobs there was to take the newspapers and separate them out, the slick um, ads and the regular newspaper. So they could use the regular newspaper for the dog, dog cages. So that, again, that's just another example of an activity you could do at home easily. Um, another one that he did, and I didn't put a slide in here for this, but I think this would be a cool one to do, is um, have, um, have pictures of um, cold items that you would put in the refrigerator and pantry items and separate those out. And again, that could be something you could cut out of magazines quite easily, Google Images. Then that would teach them not only a functional living skill when they when they got you know a certain age like Nick. As soon as I put the bags down from the grocery store, he's he's that's his jam. So <laughs> that. Um, that is also teaching a functional living skill at home, but it could potentially turn into a job where you could do that um, at, at a grocery store or for, for, for Nick, for example, once um, out of high school, he's now in a day program. He did um, worked at a food pantry where he was stocking the shelves there. So kind of, I like to give you guys that, um, that kind of the North Star where these, these structured activities started and where that took Nick. And like I said, start small, build up, find that highly preferred reward and keep, the, keep that consistency in what you're doing. And, and really now Nick is at a point where he does all these bends because um, he's been doing some long, so long he can do them with no prompting, um, except every once in a while me saying, um, what are you working for? What are you working for? <laughs> so just to, to get a little off test, but for the most part, I'm, I can be um, sitting at the, t at another table doing my work while he does this as well. So we're both kind of working, working it out at home here. But guys, the future is so bright. I've got to wear shades, right? <laughs> so that is Mr. Nick there. And again, he takes a lot of pride in, in his work. <laughs> Gotta love Snapchat, right? And then um, last um, but not least, this is um, my information. Uh, the blog I mentioned at uh, nickspecialneeds.com. And then you can click on all my social media sites uh, on my main website, teresaunderstahl.com. And yes, we are on Facebook and Insta, and that's my book, A New Course. And that um, is, let's see, I published it in May. And it is, I think it's about 85 strong five-star reviews on 85 on Amazon. It not only is a memoir, but it also has a lot of good information. It, it not only at the end of each chapter, but um, at the very end, I have what my version of an appendix. So what you're getting is pretty much a summation of all my blogs broken down into whether it's IEP tips, um, travel tips, uh, going to the doctor, going to the dentist, um, family dynamics. There's quite a quite a treasure chest at the end. Um, so that is, and it's available on Amazon. So. <laughs> All right. So I think that's what I have. And if we can see if there's any questions or see I see what the guesses are. I'm kind of speaking of that. Yeah. On the dog. Yeah. Um, Teresa, I just want to say. Um, from myself, I, this is super, super helpful. I really, really like how you're tying these uh, structured activities at home and we can clearly see the benefits at, at being able to tie those activities to 
life skills, to opposition, you know, vocational skills, opportunities to play a meaningful part in your community, um, you know, have a work and, uh, you know, be as independent as possible based on, you know, that consistent practicing of those, um, those structured bin activities. It's really neat to see. And I, I can say for one, and as someone who does work directly with individuals with um, autism and sometimes with that dual diagnosis, I can really see how some of these activities uh, could be really valuable. And I'm gonna steal some of your ideas um, for sure. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions and we have some guesses. Uh, oh, so good. I can go ahead and take um, a look at our Q&A yeah. here. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, and just um, so you guys know, the next, uh, all we have three more of these. So the next one is going to be speech and AAC strategies. And so we're going to do talk low tech and high tech speech AAC for, and this is all geared for, for co-occurring Down syndrome autism. The one after that will be, um, I'll be joined with occupational therapist. So we'll be talking about sensory diets and regulation and, you know, alerting activities, calming activities and all that. And then the last one in May is our behavior ABA. So that's going to kind of tie everything together. So we're super excited to, to help you guys navigate uh, Down syndrome and autism. All right. So I'm going to stop my share here. This is exciting. Um, it, it really is. The both the first um, webinar for those of you who joined us with um, uh, no Noemi uh, Spinazzi, Dr. Spinazzi, they had some really awesome information to share um, at our last webinar. This has been just great. Despite any technical difficulties, um, you definitely got the, the ideas across. And I, I hope that um, those of you guys who are joining us are starting to really get excited and motivated about thinking about how you can utilize the strengths-based approach to really develop meaningful skills that can be generalized into in the across environments into real life skills and um, participation in your community. So that's really cool, made me excited. Um, I'm gonna take a look at some of these questions. The first one I have, do we wanna address questions before the big reveal or song oh. guest? Yeah, let me um, let me just pop in here real quick. Um, the the Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area, we have a full low tech library that's available. I believe it's on the website, mm -hmm. and um, so that is a treasure. Speaking of another treasure trove of um, wealth that is open um, at um, our website, which is dscba. I should know what, org. org. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and also for those of you, uh, we do have a low tech library. It is um, on our uh, dscba.org. Um, under our programs, you'll see um, um, augmentative and alternative communications page. Um, also though, under the education tab, um, the DSEA education tab, we have uh, links to our teach series, our teach workshops that we um, have presented over the past year um, to replace some of our on-site trainings and workshops. And we actually, I did um, a workshop on the Low Tech Library. And so you can also reference that workshop in order to better understand how to navigate the library a little bit more. Um, but please feel free to explore tons of low tech, printable, customizable um, picture exchange systems so that, and schedule, visual schedules. Um, it, it's a really, it is a wealth of, uh, um, you know, materials that you can use, print at home, or even have us customize for you. So that if your kiddo likes Sprite or McDonald's or Taco Bell, you can actually um, kind of import those big motivators that attach more meaning to their interests that will probably get more buy-in from your kids. So explore that the low tech library is for you to use and take advantage of and if you have any questions you can always feel free to email me elizabeth at dscba.org and i'd be happy to help you navigate that um, or support you in any way we can um okay so teresa how long are the task periods usually Oh, each tat, you know, it's, that's going to be up to the, the, the age and the developmental level of your child. The, for Nick, 
when we, I'm trying to think when we first started this, I would maybe put one task in each bin. So it could take five minutes. It could take one minute. Sometimes it takes 10 minutes, <laughs> depending on what kind of day he's having. So, um, and I'm not ashamed to say that when some days when I think I'll put two, two in or three in of those, especially those folders, cause he's so fast at those. If he's had one of those days where he's dragging, I might kind of sneak one out just because it's like, okay, you're not feeling it today. And, that, and I respect that. Yeah. And I think that it's good. You know, you mentioned starting small and knowing your kiddo or knowing your student, um, understanding kind of where he or she is in the day, the mood, uh, motivation, how, you know, if it's a preferred activity, non-preferred, I think it's important to, um, I know that Teresa mentioned in her slides, not give anything a specific you know, let them go at their own pace and, and where they are, but also recognizing where if you're starting to see some behaviors or you're starting to see maybe something, I know that I have students that I know as soon as they start stemming a little bit, they might be um, not as interested in the activity. It's important to be successful. And so I think that, you know, if it's something that you planned on doing or allowed 10 minutes for, but you're seeing that there's some hesitation and maybe you only get in two or three successful minutes, you know, end on that success. So to help build that confidence that to complete that task. So like Teresa said, you might have to like sneak some things away <laughs> or, you know, or just kind of redirect in a different way so that um, you're building upon those small successes and then you can extend that expectation, right? Or maybe set that visual timer for a longer period and build those, um, you know, build those skills, but with the little successes, I think is a good way to, to put it and be flexible. You gotta be flexible. Um, yeah, how absolutely. Often yeah, absolutely. And let me, let me just add yeah. that uh, again, going back to what are their interests? Like Nick's, he still likes Tom's to train. Well, I mean, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to still throw that puzzle in or he's, um, you know, just finding, you know, it, it, you want to make it a party, let's just say, I mean, you, this is not, this is not school, this is like some things to help build skill sets for the future, yes, but it, it can still be fun, it can still be something that gives them a sense of accomplishment, and I guarantee you that after Nick does these bends, he is so much calmer, so can't say enough for that that alone <laughs> yeah when we talk about a strengths-based approach we're not just talking about those core strengths that that individual possesses but also what are his motivators what are the things that are going to keep him engaged what are the his interests right you're playing into um you know all of those strengths like what makes that kiddo tick right and um, the more fun engaging and um again attached to big motivators the more buy-in you're going to get. And Teresa, I know that you had talked about the um, you using like edibles as a tangible reward and that uh, we've heard it, you know, through different communities that that we, you know, that's not the first go to that people want to use, right? We don't want to reward our kids with food. Our kiddos with Down syndrome a lot of times are super motivated by food. Um, and we have to be careful too about um, low metabolism and, and you know, not having access to the same, those kinds of things all the time. That being said, um, when you're working with um, that dual diagnosis, that autism piece and um, the Down syndrome piece, and we need to get buy-in and you need to get some a kiddo to say, all right, I'm going to participate in this. So you may have to start with something like you know, a tangible edible item that is super preferred and that's super motivating for that person. And then once you start building those skills, once they start understanding, you can kind of taper off, not trying to tell you to do food, but if that is the thing, I don't want you to be afraid of it. And especially if you're using it in, you know, limited quantity, like Teresa said, you don't get that thing very often. Um, you can kind of start there and then it may turn into a different item that or or an activity you know that that is engaging and fun and motivating but whatever can get you that buy-in that initial buy-in that actually gets them to attend an activity <laughs> yeah then that's something they'll start looking forward to and then you can kind of taper from there and fade out those those edibles if you can yeah you know just remembering in high school nick um they, they, their template was a little different. Instead of a one, two, three, four, they did S-P-R-I-T-E. So S was the first bin. 
and think about it in high school, that's very age appropriate, you know, to, to, you know, oh, get the pop or the yeah, <laughs> <soda> yeah. pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, how often would you, or how often would you do uh, structured teaching during a typical day with school? That's the question. Well, it depends on there's, I mean, if they're already in school, they're probably getting enough there. So, you know, I, when I, when Nick was in school, I probably had him do it maybe three times a week, but, you know, m probably more so on the weekend because school, the school day is long, but I know right now with hybrid schedules and things being half day or, or so, this might be a good time to put in to supplement what what they're getting you know if it is that situation so um let's see could you explain the emotion cans again um what did they place inside the cans okay so the 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 icons themselves were you know happy sad um I'm trying to think what else it was Mad. You could, yeah you could start Mad. with just a couple you know you don't have to do all those uh, and then just taking pictures of those faces like like happy <laughs> Sad. <laughs> but um, you know what's actually a really good thing to do. Um, it, again, I I keep mentioning Thomas the Tank Engine, but they they have very animated faces there. But also like Toy Story, some of those characters, you could cut out what again whatever you're, you know your child's into, those faces and go okay it's happy and then you just drop those in. So there there's actually a bin at the bot or a, a pile of faces at the bottom there but um, I certainly think that again find that hook if, if they're into Toy Story or trying to think what's what's cool right now because I'm so out of it because <laughs> my son's 27 but Frozen and Moana and all yeah. of them right all of those different motivators a lot of our kiddos like princesses or like it and 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 um with that um a uh, co-occurring diagnosis, we might have that like restricted interest, right? That perseverated interest, that thing that just, it's like, I want this and nothing else. And, you know, use, you can leverage that, right? To, um, to really get that buy-in. Also um, just wanted to note that the feelings and emotion cards are, um, and of course, these are going to be those picture exchange kind of like the ones you saw that are anime, you know, but just to, not real life faces, but um, we do have those in our low tech library. So if you want immediate access to those feeling cards and you want to start at least building it um, with using those tools, you can print those out. We've got them available to you. So check those out. Um, and not only just like with feelings, we've got situational things, holidays, birthday parties, at the playground, at school, morning routines, evening routines. So just tons and tons of, of pictures. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can find it all in our low tech library. Um, let's see. Our next question is, do you strategically put task periods in a day's schedule? Are you strategic about it, I guess, throughout the day, maybe? Is that what, or is it like a concentrated, this is work time, and then we just live the rest of our lives throughout the day? I think it depends on the family. For, for, for my purposes, I, uh, we tend to do them in the morning. We have a personal support worker who does those with him often. Um, so she'll do those in the morning while I'm working. But that's not to say you couldn't do it, you know, I, ideally you want to do it when they're they're you know they're going to be more motivated you know probably you know in the afternoon they're dragging it may not be as effective but you have to know your child so you know and Teresa I was thinking you know with some of those self-help tasks for example right so maybe um if you're doing laundry later in the day it's a you know hey can you come help you know there might be naturalistic opportunities to depending on your kiddo you know you know your home environment um but there may be naturalistic opportunities to kind of insert a task or a skill that we're working on kind of embed that into just some things you're doing around the house. So I think it's one of those things, yeah, you kind of have to just determine that for yourself and what works yeah. for. Yeah, I think if I'm, if I were to say to doing structured teaching, I would keep this in a block as is. However, that's not to say um, Nick doesn't help me with the laundry, um, loading the laundry. Like at night, he will um, put a load, he'll bring that down. So that's good, heavy work. 
downstairs, load the washing machine, and he loves tennis balls. He likes tapping tennis balls, can of tennis balls. So always have tennis balls in there. He knows that he's going to get those. So, but that, that would be separate. And that's just an, a whole nother, you know, um, opportunity for him, opportunity, let's put it that way, <laughs> for him to help out and, you know, feel like he's contributing around the house. Well, I think that makes sense then. That helps us better understand how you want to approach the structured teaching activities versus you know, necessary, strategically placing them throughout the day. Yeah. Using that block of time. That makes a lot of sense. I think that clarifies that question. Um, here's another question. Do you have suggestions for how to implement these strategies when you cannot control the entire situation? Um, as I feel right now with remote learning, because one, the school is the one controlling the overall material being presented to my son. And two, because he has younger siblings who are around and may need things or distract their brother or just be doing something else that he would uh, prefer to be doing. Um, and she's uh, referring to her six-year-old son. So um, any ways to, so, so to implement these strategies when you aren't in that controlled environment where it's like, here we are in a quiet room and this is how we can do it. Um, any recommendations or tips for that? I, you know, um, actually I'm, I'm thinking about Sam on this one because we did have a conversation um, about this and because they've got, they got a house full. Yeah, <laughs> they got a, you know he's got a, you know, they got a, a little baby just starting to walk and an older brother doing this and that and so I I, I feel like if you just st again start small just one one thing and then build from there. Oh look what I did and I get this I get that thing that thing I really want. And then try to build the two. Just keep it in a small increment and do the best you can with the space that you have and the environment you have. The other thing that um, that uh, Sam's mom brought up was because everything's kind of, blah, blah, you know, sometimes it's not just her with him. Sometimes her, the older brother's the one that's helping and he responds really good to different people being there to kind of facilitate whatever that is. The key, I think, really is to, to pick activities that they for sure are going to be able to master right away. Don't try to teach a new skill because I think that's, I mean, yes, it'd be nice to add those in, but the purpose here is to teach them independence and doing something on their own. So, you know, as, in as much as you can find the ones that are going to set them up for success first. And then I, I tend to slide in some of the harder ones as well, but I always have the slam dunks in there for sure. I hope that, I hope that helps. Um. We have a, um, a question that says, how many activities do you sprinkle throughout a school day and on um, off school days? And do you sprinkle or is it, uh, you know, I see that there's that one through four, you know, I'm, is it just that, that clear block or yeah. are, is there a sprinkling? That's a clear block <laughs> for me. I just think that's Boom, yeah. But that's not to say we're not, again, sprinkling and folding, you know, if I'm folding. Here, Nick, want to help me fold your underwear or fold mm -hmm. these, you know, towels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Again, I think it kind of goes back to, depends on how much they're going to school. You know, on a typical school day, they, you may not even need to do these activities. Right, right. They're pretty fried by then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in regards to emotions, it looks like, I really like how you mentioned asking your son why he was feeling a certain way. Our son is working on identifying emotions. And this is a tough one. It's pretty abstract. It takes a while um, to communicate why he's feeling a certain way. We, uh, he would have to use his AAC device and uh, find the appropriate icon or vocabulary to tell us why or point to and use some sign language. Um, how did you start working with Nick on explaining why he's feeling something? Were there staged activities, moments where you could control or provide the vocabulary um, he would use to explain why he was feeling a certain way? Yeah, we, his, his uh, middle school teacher, she, I call her in my book, the Nick Whisper. <laughs> she, she was able to put together a, just a low tech um, picture board that had different emotions, you know, happy, sad, tired. And then 
a flip, you flip it over and then each one had their own happy, sad, tired. So happy would be, and just kind of knowing your child, she was like, I'm pretty sure these are the reasons why he's happy, you know, because he's getting ready to go get a Sprite or work for a Sprite. Or I, actually we started in middle school, it was POP, P-O-P, and then we built a Sprite. So, you know, start smaller, get bigger. You can see the difference between middle and high school. Um, and then, but like I said, each one had what we anticipated why they might be happy or sad. And it, it, again, very low tech, just, just those picture icons that you talked about that are available in the low tech library. And um, that's something um, that your child's teacher could certainly put together for you. You can ask them, they, they are more than willing to help. Um, also, just to kind of piggyback on that, I think, you know, if you have these um, uh, feelings or emotion cards handy, can you put them on a little key ring? Um, I think there's nothing better, you know, obviously you have the structured approach, but also to reinforce and generalize these concepts across environments and different situations and times of day modeling. So when you're feeling happy about something or feeling upset about something, bringing out that uh, bringing out the emotions card, talking about why you feel, what it feels like in your body. I feel my heart beating and my arms are getting stiff and my face is red and, and it, because it hurts, you know, or ouch, I stubbed my toe, it hurts and it makes me feel this way. And identifying things in, in the moment um, and um, it, using that visual aid to reinforce the concept, maybe getting out a mirror and looking at your face in the mirror and understanding the moment as it's happening in that moment. Um, so I think there are lots of ways to help reinforce that, um, you know, to kind of piggyback on those structured activities as well. But modeling is huge too, um, for them to see it in your face or to under, better understand and to understand that it happens to everyone. Um, you have to kind of start identifying feelings and how they feel physically, um, what they look like, and then attaching them to that real life experience kind of in that moment um, as a, another strategy. I actually like that idea. And I think I'm going to steal that from you because I, <laughs> and, and just have that on my person, you know, like that key ring. Cause um, there are times when, you know, Nick's iPads, it gets on YouTube and it's doing that little circle. I'm like, gotta wait, good waiting. And then, but then, or, you know, and he's just like, doesn't want to wait. And he just throws his iPad. And um, I do have all the, I know all the, um, bulletproof iPad cases. If you want to email me at tjunderstall.com, I'll be happy to cook you up <laughs> they, off the second floor and everything. But anyway, that, but you know, I, and I'm like, Nick, are you mad? Are you, you know, I'm mad, you know, so that, um, and, and, and again, you know, like the same thing, but we also want to address the happy. So if I come home and we're unloading the, the groceries and there's ho-hos, happy, and he can say that word, happy, happy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tying things to real life, you know, experiences is the best way for us all to learn, right? It makes it meaningful. And when you're feeling the way you're feeling in that moment, and then you're attaching it to that visual description, um, then it really starts to help reinforce those very abstract um, concepts that do take some time to learn and really grasp. Um, I don't, let's see, I don't know if, let's take a look. Okay, I don't think we have more questions. Um, you have a ton of compliments on your work, Teresa. It looks like we have quite a few folks who have already read your book and uh, who believe that um, the, the content in that book has truly, truly made a positive difference in, in the lives of their children, um, their, their personal relationships with their kiddos, ability to be able to work with their kids. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, you've Thank got you. a lot of fans attending today's workshop. <laughs> um, also, um, we are talking about, you know, a lot, it seems like a lot of you guys have already read the book and do have the book, but we still have some guesses oh, yeah. um, about the twerking dog song. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to share some of those and, um, let's see, we have, we'll we do have, the first one who guesses, hopefully we'll get a good, a, a, I guess we'll get so the, the first one we had was um, who let the dogs out? 
that's a good one. <laughs> you know, I, I had to make sure that wasn't an actual question um, for our <laughs> panel here. But uh, so who let us out? I'm sorry. Very good guess, but that is not uh, the correct answer. We have several folks who have all come together on the same answer, which is baby got back. Okay. Um, well, that would be correct. So whoever was the first one to guess, uh, one second, please, dare I? Like, 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 wow. That's amazing. I, uh, and as a matter of fact, um, Kyle, you were the first one and, uh, yeah, you broke into the lyrics with I love big butts and I cannot Ooh. lie. Um, and so Kyle, I don't know if you have the book yet, but you are going to receive that book. Um, and also folks, guess what? Our executive director of Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area has joined us for this entire presentation. And she wanted to share with you guys we really appreciate your participation. We know how valuable this book is. And um, on behalf of Down Syndrome Connection, we'd like for everyone to have one. And we will be happy to purchase those from you, Teresa, so that we can send a book to anyone who wants one, who attended today's uh, webinar. If you don't already have one, um, we would be more than happy to mail you your very own book, even if you did not guess the right answer. How does that sound, Teresa? <laughs> We buy books Fantastic. from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and after you read them, let's boot, um, we want to uh, boost our five-star reviews on uh, Amazon for your book. Right. So please provide feedback. Help other families who are seeking support and a better understanding. Help them know that this is where you go and spread the word so that we have more families who feel supported, who feel uh, that there is a community out there who's willing to share ideas, experiences, knowledge, um, so that we can all um, support these kiddos and give them the best opportunities for living their best lives. So um, we do appreciate that you all, all um, participated with us today. Um, and hopefully, I know that I took away with a lot of great information I cannot wait to use with some of my students. And um, I really appreciate your time, Teresa. You're a wealth of knowledge. It's always a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine, and we look forward to seeing you guys for webinar three. And again, we have three, we have three more to go. Just uh, they're all the fourth Saturday of the month at um, noon Central Time, ten o'clock Pacific Time, and we look forward to having you join us for the next one. Again, that's the speech. We'll be talking about AAC, low high tech, how to get evaluated, um, how to make. I mean, it's one thing to have a speech device; it's another thing to take that to a level where it gives your child a voice, which is so, so, so important. Absolutely. And also, I just wanted to let you guys know, um, a lot of times we have follow-up questions, we have follow-up ideas or thoughts, and our support doesn't just stop here with our webinar. We are here to support you in any way we can. If you have DS, ASD related questions, follow up questions to this webinar, or just general questions in general, and you need some consultation. Teresa's here to help you out with that. I'm also available to help um, um, any education related questions, and this falls under that umbrella as well. Please feel free to reach out to me as well. We are here to support you um, all the time, not just during these webinars. So, Elizabeth at dscba.org. And Teresa, are you just Teresa at, uh, or Teresa? Uh, TJ Unnerstall at Comcast.net. Aha, yeah. uh -huh. TJ Unnerstall, that's U-N-N-E-R-S-T-A-L-L -L, at Comcast.net. Uh, so please feel free to reach out. We're here for you as always. And in the meantime, everybody have a great weekend. And thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at, at our next webinar. Bye, guys. Thanks, Teresa. We appreciate it. Take Thank care. Thank you.